This is a national take cover warning. An enemy attack is expected. Yes, nuclear war could have happened. It was always there, it was always a possibility. There was a great deal of anxiety. Young people who went to school in those days, they didn't know whether they would ever live to grow up. It had to be secret, of course. And when you think of it, you've got to build this humongous uh, building, keep it secret, and get it done as little as 13 months. The facility is over 100,000 square feet in size, four stories underground, and it was designed to withstand a nuclear blast of five megatons at a distance of 1.8 kilometers. I knew it was a special building, but I had no idea what they were going to use it for. If an H-bomb explodes, at the first flash of brilliant light, duck. Then, if possible, keep going. This warning was recorded in 1960 at the height of the Cold War. It was never actually played for the general public. It was produced in the event that Canada was under attack by weapons of mass destruction. In the early 1960s, the United States and Russia had begun the ultimate game of chicken with nuclear weapons. The Cold War was upon us, and Canadians, like other world powers, began making survival preparations in case of nuclear war. Secrets of the exhibit will take you behind the scenes of this living anachronism. A tour of the bunker brings our secret nuclear past into the harsh cold of the present. Today, it is a museum, but in 1961, it was the best chance of survival for an entire government. There were quite an arms race going on. There were numbers of nuclear weapons were increasing very, very rapidly. We had sirens right across the country, mostly uh, near hospital and uh, school. So if they had a warning, the kids were supposed to know what to do at the time and uh, duck under your table. Prime Minister John Diefenbaker ordered several underground bunkers to be secretly built in key cities throughout Canada. In the small town of Carp, just west of Ottawa, Canada's capital, a top secret construction project began. It was built in 1959 to 61, uh, and it was meant to house certain members of our federal government and uh, military in the event of a nuclear war, presumably somewhere in North America here. Constructing a building that would survive a nuclear blast was no small feat. It had to be a completely self-contained underground building. With time of the essence, it would represent one of the greatest engineering challenges of its time. The first step was to find a suitable location close to Ottawa. Many bunkers were built in a mountain. Unfortunately, in the Ottawa area, we don't have any mountains. That's why uh, the soil's not very good here. It's Ottawa limestone basically breaks up into gravel eventually. It's not a very good place to build a very deep facility. So uh, they really just thought, well, we'll build one close to the ground, but we'll just make it extra strong compared to other bunkers. The gravel, however, turned out to be a bonus when constructing a vibration-free building. The engineers looked at about 15 sites in the whole Ottawa Valley, and it just turns out that uh, basically we're sitting on an area that has very gravelly soil, very sandy gravelly soil. So if you built a structure underground, the vibration of a bomb hitting the ground nearby would not be transferred into the building. It actually only transmits about 8% of the vibration uh, of a nuclear weapon hitting the ground within a mile or two of the structure. Uh, the water table is also uh, very, very low. It's well below the building, which means all of your, your voids in the gravel, the, the building is sitting on gravel, uh, are dry. Uh, if they were full of water, that vibration again would transfer right into the, and touch the building and it would shake the building rather violently. You may lose some uh, of the building. The engineers came up with a design that was sophisticated in its simplicity. It's basically a giant cube of concrete, 154 feet square. It's set into the side of what was a, a hill. It was actually partially excavated uh, as a gravel pit. So it's a giant concrete cube with a soil on top of it. 
Designed to survive a nuclear blast equivalent to 5 million tons of TNT, the bunker called for 32,000 cubic yards of concrete and 5,000 tons of steel, enough for the normal construction of a 20-story building. Concrete was poured by hand, using wheelbarrows, and in some cases, the pour lasted up to 45 hours in order to have one solid mass of concrete slab. It was reinforced with rebar so thick that companies no longer manufacture it. We simply can't even find samples of it. The companies simply just don't make it anymore. So when you look at some of the construction photographs, to me it's just unbelievable that they could make walls several feet thick using uh, the smallest rebar is about two and a quarter inches and uh, the big stuff is four inches and it's actually wrapped uh, around several times as well. So it's almost like solid steel walls. The rebar would support a four-story underground building with walls five feet thick. A series of 36 massive support columns spaced every 22 feet would span from top to bottom of the structure. They uh, put in about 36 columns, which are rather big in diameter. They also have what's called a shear head on the top. It spans out to try to collect as much weight as it can. It transfers the loading down into the concrete. The concrete goes all the way down to the bottom, uh, each pillar, and it cones out again to try to make a bit of a foot so that it can uh, not punch the concrete pillar right through the bottom. The bunker engineers were working with the most up-to-date specs on nuclear blasts available. It's called a, a blast wave. Some people call it a mock front. When a nuclear weapon goes off, of course, there's a very bright flash, which is extremely bright. But basically, as the uh, reaction starts, it actually superheats the air very, very fast. And this air produces a pressure wave, and it proceeds out from the weapon uh, very, very fast. Actually, about 15 times the speed of sound initially, and then it slows down. And at the distance that uh, the bunker was meant to survive a 5-megaton bomb at 1.1 uh, miles, well, at 1.1 miles, where I'm standing, uh, that pressure wave would be uh, between 7 to 10 tons per square foot. And it only lasts a few seconds, but it's literally going to try to crush anything it can come across as it proceeds um, away from the weapon. And um, this building is meant to survive that repeatedly. The general population of Canada had no idea that their tax dollars were being used to provide a safe haven for certain government personnel. So the site was intended to hold approximately 535 military and government personnel for a shutdown period of 30 days after the bomb detonated. So that meant the designers of the site ensured that there was everything necessary in the site for that 30 days. So you've got your medical center, the communication centers, rations, kitchens, washroom facilities, anything that a community of 535 people might need for a 30-day period of time. There was a top secret list of people who would staff the bunker in the event of a nuclear attack. Who exactly would have been on that list is, is at this point still unknown. We've had a lot of visitors come through and say, oh yes, I would have been here, I would have manned such and such. Um, we do know that there would have been a lot of communications personnel. They would have been military. Uh, the government that would have been here would have been 10 to 12 cabinet ministers, their support personnel, the prime minister and the governor general, and of course their support personnel. And then the civilians who would have been here would have been some maintenance personnel as well as some kitchen personnel. But the interesting thing is none of that 535 were permitted to bring their spouses. Um, everyone who was designated to be here had to have preparations made at home for their family to withstand whatever the crisis end up being, and they chose to come here alone. One of the legends about this site is that Prime Minister Diefenbaker actually refused to come to the Diefen bunker because his wife was not permitted. So he was going to stay at 24 Sussex with Olive, and that was to be the end of it. The Deputy Prime Minister would have come in his place, and he would have stayed with his wife. Almost 50 years since its creation, the bunker is no longer top secret and finally open to the public. Rooms have been faithfully recreated to present an accurate representation of a time when the world was literally minutes away from annihilation. This is a national take cover warning. An enemy attack is expected. Listen for further instructions.
As the threat of nuclear war changed from possible to probable, world powers scrambled to ensure the safety of their nation's leaders. In the small town of Carp, just outside of Ottawa, Canada's capital, construction on a top secret underground bunker had begun. Built by many, yet seen by few, it stood in readiness to shield our nation's leaders. The general population of Canada, however, was kept in the dark about the bunker. Even construction workers had only been given enough information to complete their particular job. People who worked here were not allowed to talk about it. Uh, some people were only allowed to work a certain length of time and then they were left. Uh, engineers who designed parts of machines, they were never allowed to see the whole thing that they were designing. Uh, even people who worked here were not allowed to uh, go around this building. Even the commanding officer was not allowed to just wander around. Uh, everything was on a need-to-know basis. Pierre Remillard worked at the construction site in 1959. I knew it was a special building, but I had no idea what they were going to use it for. Uh, later on, we find out, but uh, no, at the beginning, no. The entrance to the bunker is deceptively simple. Wide open fields house a small Quonset hut with a garage door. But that's where the simplicity ends. Visitors travel down a long, dark tunnel to arrive at a set of heavy steel doors. The blast tunnel is almost 400 feet in length, and it was designed at 90 degrees to the entrance. So what its purpose was, was to take the fireball from that nuclear bomb and channel it straight past the entrance. So rather than attempting to construct a door that was thick enough and powerful enough to withstand a thousand mile per hour wind barreling down at it, they said, okay, forget it. What we'll do is we'll construct the entrance at 90 degrees. The wind will rip right past. There'll be some suction and a fair bit of pressure on the entrance, but it'll be able to withstand it. So the uh, tunnel literally is just in one end of the hill and right out the next. Entrance doors made of two tons of steel are located midway down the tunnel. They were monitored around the clock by armed guards. The passenger doors are approximately 18 inches thick. Uh, there are two sets of those, and they would have been opened only one at a time to provide, first of all, an airlock in terms of letting personnel in, so you are controlling the air as it's coming in and going out, but also for security purposes. If you've always got one door closed, you know whom you're letting in and whom you're letting out. Doug Beaton knows the layout of the Defen bunker better than most of those who were stationed here. Now there are two sets here, but the building is under positive pressure, so there's a bit of an airlock here. So you, this door would open for you once you uh, inform the guard. You would walk in several feet. That door will close behind you, and at this point, this door, which was closed, will now open. You'll feel perhaps a bit of air come by you because, of course, the building is now pushing air out. Once you step through the doors, you are on the main level of the bunker, known as the 400 level. Anyone admitted to the bunker was immediately directed to the decontamination area. Well, this was the original guard area. Now, that guard uh, would have measured you if you had had some radioactive particles on you. You would have uh, had to take a shower. At this point, the guard could look through these lead glass windows, and you would have gone this way through a double shower area. If you had had some radioactivity on you, some particles stuck to you, you would have had to come through the shower area. You would take one shower with your clothes on, and those clothes actually go into this uh, container up here, which falls into a, a concrete room. You will then take a second shower. But then at that point, you will be given your uniform or your civilian dress. Then you will actually come into the bunker for the first time. After being decontaminated, personnel would be directed down the hall to the hospital for further examination. The hospital is the only area in the bunker under negative pressure. The room does not have an exhaust fan. That way, disease cannot be spread to any other part of the building. There is an operating theater. There originally was a dentist's uh, chair in the corner. There's an x-ray unit. 
Uh, everything was uh, provided because, of course, at this point, you would assume you are in a lockdown position. You simply can't exit the building. So everything you need has to be inside. With space at a premium and beds scarce, rooms were fitted with bunk beds. Beds often did double duty with people using them in 12-hour shifts. So here we are in the hospital overflow room that has six bunk beds in here. If you needed to, of course, you could have actually had 12 people in here if uh, people were going back to work or anything like that. With every detail of the facility fashioned to duplicate the outside world, it would be easy to think you were in just any other building until you begin to notice that all the furniture is bolted to the floor. Um, the simple reason being, even though this building weighs 64,000 tons and is 154 feet square, uh, it would have moved and had a blast wave uh, pushed on us from the outside. Even though we have five feet of hardened concrete above us and 25 feet of soil, this building would actually move about three quarters of an inch. Visitors will notice that heavy pieces of equipment are mounted on giant shock absorbers. So here's uh, one of the heavier pieces of equipment on this floor. It's just an air conditioning unit. However, uh, it does point out one interesting feature. This whole building is meant to move approximately three quarters of an inch if a blast wave hit it. Well, that is actually, when you think of it, that's the space between this spring here. So this uh, air conditioning unit is sitting on this very heavy mass and hopefully would survive some of the shaking simply by bouncing up and down for a little while. The teletype room and teleprinter repair room are also situated on the 400 level. Since communication lines were buried underground, it made sense to locate the teletype room as close to ground level as possible. It was manned by personnel whose knowledge of the bunker was on a strict need-to-know basis. Mike Green was a corporal in the Canadian Armed Forces when he was stationed at the CARP facility. When I was posted here, I knew absolutely nothing about, uh, about CARP other than the fact that it was uh, a major communication site and it was underground and top secret. And that's all that they would tell you. When I arrived here, they brought you inside the door and you signed all the necessary papers, got your picture taken. Then they put a bag over your head and walked you all around the top floor and said, these are all the secret places and you don't get to see them. <laughs> Security throughout the bunker was extraordinarily tight. The safety of Canada depended on it. I was cleared for this, where we are right here now in the teletype shop. And next door was the communication center, the message center. I was allowed in there. At the back of the message center was a uh, large computer called the Strad Room. And uh, I wasn't allowed in there. Uh, down the hallway outside here, I couldn't go down that hallway because there was no need for me to go down that hallway. So I went from this room basically in the message center, and from there I went downstairs to the uh, kitchen area or down to where the quarters were if I was going down to see somebody. But otherwise, you were pretty restricted in where you went. If you were found in a hallway you weren't supposed to be, you had a lot of questions to answer. As the amount of regular bunker personnel increased, bits of information about the building might be quietly shared but only among the staff. Oh, people talk to each other here, but uh, when you were outside of here, you didn't discuss anything that went on here or what happened here, what it was for here. I, I couldn't even tell my wife what I worked on here, what we did here, how many people were here. All of that was secret information, and, and, uh, and it was kept that way. If you started opening your mouth at the wrong time, uh, you soon had uh, some rather large men arrive with <laughs> to escort you away. And they took that very, very seriously. Security was a very high priority. As a teletype technician, my job here was to repair the teletype machines. Now, the teletype at that time were a British-made model, and uh, they had to be kept going. We had, we had the ones that were in service, and there was about 60 or 70 of them uh, in operation at, at one time. But we also had a 100% backup and then another 100% spare on top of that. So we had lots of equipment. 
But if things were locked down for an extended period of time, the ha that equipment had to be available in order to maintain the communications across Canada and around the world. And it was very, very important. This shop operated uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the same as the message center did. We had more people on during the day than at the other hours, but there was always a couple of people on in the evening and at least one person on overnight. So it was very necessary to have a technician available in case one of the printers went down, then we'd have to bring it into the shop here, repair it, and make sure it checked out, ready to, to go for the, next, for the next one that broke down. If an H-bomb explodes, at the first flash of brilliant light, duck. Then, if possible, keep going. If you can not go on, and get your car off the road. Find fallout protection. Take what supplies you can, including the radio. Well, we had to maintain communications. In today's world, the telephone uh, or the internet is, is the equivalent of what the teletype machines were at that time. Today, we go in and sit down at, a, at, uh, at an internet, at our computer, and we're on the internet. We're talking all around the world. Here, Everything was fixed line, and so there was wire, hard wires running from here to places like uh, Renfrew and Arnprior and uh, Smith Falls, and then from there it was dis uh, disseminated across the world, across Canada, on uh, railway lines and, and Bell telephone lines. But the communications had to be maintained 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because this was our lifeline. If, if something happened anywhere in Canada concerning the military, then it, the information had to get back to Ottawa or to wherever else it was pertinent at the time. So the communication was vital 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The field up top, up on top of the bunker, was covered with antennas. And there are actually statistics we've got in our archives that show that I believe it was 80 to 90 percent of those antennas would have survived that initial blast and so would have been available to transmit. That would have been for the amateur and the high, low, and mid frequency radio stations. With the CBC station, they were a little more ca uh, cagey. What they did is they buried the cable for transmission um, and took it about 50 miles west of here. So the actual tower for transmitting for CBC radio was buried 50 miles west of here in the anticipation that the enemy could track that particular radio station and if they wanted to bomb it, they would bomb 50 miles west of here, not the actual site. CHU Canada, coordinated universal time, 15 hours, 40 minutes, Kansas. Just down the hall from the teletype room is a small room set up for amateur radio. It was thought that in addition to teletype, Bunker staff would be able to keep in touch with survivors on the outside world through ham radio. The government began to organize the general population of Canada for the possibility of war. Amateur radio people were, of course, uh, going to be a tremendous asset to the recovery of Canada. Uh, the communication, of course, was uh, global uh, and was at very low power, so, of course, any uh, bombers couldn't really find them. So. Uh, the government actually gave you a small uh, monitor and they could turn it on and tell you to get to your station and you would be expected to help out with civil defense matters uh, all across North America. Stock your shelter for survival. You need food, water, medicine, eating and cooking utensils, flashlight and batteries, or candles, clothing, bedding, sanitary items, first aid supplies, and all the other essentials which will keep you alive in the shelter for 14 days. Don't forget the battery radio. If you don't have one, turn up the radio you are listening to so that you can hear it from the shelter. More details on survival supplies will follow. While the rest of the population maintained a state of vigilance, the country's leaders prepared to go underground. Emergency measures within the bunker were well underway.
commissioned at the height of the Cold War, the Diefenbunker was designed to house the Prime Minister of Canada and his war cabinet in the face of escalating world tensions. Secrets of the exhibit will take you behind the scenes to level 300, where, 100 feet below the Earth's surface, the Emergency Government Situation Center would have been manned around the clock. These people here would be trying to keep track of how many casualties there were and as a result of whatever's happening on the outside. This uh, map here was used for training purposes. Now, people would come here once every so often to, well, pretend uh, certain scenarios had happened. This, for example, shows here in North America uh, quite a few number of uh, nuclear bomb hits. There is a weather office on the, right on the next office next door. You would have to, of course, uh, knowing that a bomb has hit just to the west side of Toronto here, as just an, an, an example, uh, you would have to find the effective wind direction, and you can actually go ahead and construct these semi-complicated shape here that actually shows the fallout pattern from this particular bomb after approximately a few hours. So that would tell people here how many casualties, and they would report that to the War Cabinet Room, to the Prime Minister, etc. In times of war, the Prime Minister and several of his ministers would have been able to form an emergency war cabinet. Decisions would be made here that would affect Canada and the rest of the world forever. Here is the uh, war cabinet room. We know the Prime Minister and a number of other ministers uh, could have formed a war cabinet uh, in times of emergency. We know from the uh, one picture we have that this is basically the shape of it. And here, of course, uh, they would have pulled in all of that information from the outside, from all these other ministerial departments that were represented here, about 13 or so. And all this information has been fed in to our government, and they will hopefully make some decision on how we're going to help Canadians survive, uh, what we're going to do militarily. Uh, all these sort of decisions would have to be made here. As the country's command center, the bunker would rely on the best computer technology of the times. So here we are in the Ottawa semi-automatic exchange room. This is the computer room, a relay room, again, where computers uh, made by the Burroughs Company in that era would have been used to send messages across the country, around the world. Uh, there's an encryption room next door, uh, so encrypted messages could be sent. It's a router device, a computer device and we've been able to recreate it using some uh, old computers we got from a local university. Uh, the interesting thing about this uh, whole room is actually called the Tempest Room. It's clad not only in steel, but even the uh, pillars are clad in steel as well, so that no electromagnetic radiation can leak out and uh, you'll be giving away any of your secrets, of course. Communication with the outside world was critical as the rest of Canada waited for survival instructions. CBC created its own studio within the bunker. It would be the center for Canada's national emergency broadcast. So in a total emergency, a person sitting there would be talking to virtually every single Canadian. The CBC radio station actually was part of the emergency broadcasting system of stations. So it was a network of seven stations across Canada, which was actually also, as far as I understand, allied with all radio stations. So in essence, there was an understanding. If the air raid sirens went off, all public broadcasting stations dropped off the air. Citizens would go to one of two points on the old radios, which were civil defense bands, and that's where you would pick up CBC radio signal. Initially, the recording from CBC would have been uh, a pre-recorded message, basically just saying to people what the state of affairs was. These instructions are for those who are staying in target areas. Take cover now in your blast shelter or protected area. Take your battery radio with you. Lie down and protect exposed parts of your body. So the air raid signs have gone off, an attack is expected take cover and keep uh, listening for more information. As the crisis progressed, that recording would have been replaced by live CBC reporters. The Prime Minister and the Governor General also probably would have given reports as to what the state of affairs was. Conveniently situated just around the corner from the broadcast booth is the Prime Minister's office. And attached to that, his own private bedroom. 
Well, here we are in the Prime Minister's bedroom. Rather luxurious, of course. The Prime Minister and the Governor General are the only two people in this entire building that have a separate bedroom to themselves. It's rather large. Uh, there are 28 single bedrooms. If you're a minister, you would have a single bedroom, which is a little bit bigger than this bed, actually. Uh, but uh, it is single, of course. Everybody else is going to be in those uh, larger bedrooms that we've already seen. Uh, also, the Prime Minister and the Governor General are the only two that have a separate shower to themselves. Unlike the other secretaries, the Prime Minister's secretary has her own spacious office. So Mr. Diefenbaker's uh, secretary would have uh, had a rather large office, actually. It's one of the biggest ones in the entire building. Now, the television system is, again, a live feed from the Emergency Government Situation Center, so one can just imagine that the secretary would be sitting here and Mr. Diefenbaker could have come in here in the 1960s and you could actually see, basically, the damage done to Canada uh, right here on the screen. It is a closed circuit. Uh, feed right from the building itself. It's not an exterior feed. Bunker engineers realized if hit by a nuclear blast, the front steel doors could sustain damage and become inoperable. Strategically located on the 300 level, just steps from the prime minister's quarters, an escape hatch was built. It was simple in design, yet crucial to the bunker's inhabitants. And this is one of the two escape hatches for the bunker. Now, if you ever wanted to get out, uh, this is uh, one way out. Assuming the front doors, uh, those blast doors may be jammed or uh, for whatever reason they're not functioning and you have to get out, there are two other ways out of the bunker, and this is one of them here. The theory is, of course, that you uh, won't go into this area, that you'd be on the outside of the bunker at this point, and you've got about uh, 25 feet of a piece stone above you in a tube. There's a trigger, which you lever up here. You just have to pull that. At that point, the piece stone falls down into a pit. You've got welded on rungs going up to the surface. Uh, the, the cover would have collapsed and broken at that point just because of the suction. And uh, voila, you're, you're free to go and go down and get our uh, bulldozer, which may have been down at the underground garage, and maybe come up the tunnel and try to get those doors open. So here we have a model of the escape hatch. Now, the idea would be once this uh, is triggered, all of this piece stone will fall down into the pit that you just saw in there. One floor below the office of the Prime Minister, level 200, housed a cafeteria large enough to feed 500 inhabitants around the clock for 30 days. Here we are in the cafeteria, it is really the largest room in the place, about 65 feet square. Uh, officers ate in a certain uh, lounge area over there, um, and everybody else would eat in this area here. Uh, we have a few of the original tables here, but generally you have to imagine this place, uh, if we're locked down, this place would all be tables and chairs in order to feed five to 600 people, uh, basically four meals a day, since it'll be of course around the clock here. Uh, this would be a very crowded and a very noisy area. The shutdown period was for 30 days, and that meant they did have enough supplies for the 30 days. The thought at the time was after 30 days, the radiation would have dropped to a safe enough point where one could venture outside, uh, survey the countryside, see what's going on, reestablish communication lines if necessary, and then come back to the bunker as well as collect more uh, supplies. So on site, there was always approximately seven to 10 days worth of fresh food, normally for approximately 150 people. If there was an increase in international tensions, that quantity of fresh food would actually be bumped up to enough fresh food for five to 10 days still, but for um, 535 people. There were, to survive the last 20 days of a 30-day lockdown, rations. Fortunately for the personnel who staffed the bunker at the time, meals never came down to rations. The food here was fabulous. We operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And when I first arrived here, and, and even when I left here in 1972, at that time, uh, fresh rations were brought in every week. And rather than let them go bad, they prepared the fresh rations for the people that were, that were working here. Just off the side of the cafeteria was a lounge area with a television, a pool table, and card tables. Down in the uh, lounge area downstairs, 
there was a shuffleboard, there was darts, and of course you could play cards. They didn't have a pool table here at that time, but most of the people played either cards or darts and uh, sat around and shoot the breeze. It seemed the engineers had thought of everything when designing a self-contained bunker. Level 100, the deepest level, housed machines that would allow people to live underground for 30 days. And in a far corner sat a secret room encased in double cement, intended to hold Canada's most valuable commodity. This is level 100, the deepest reaches of the bunker designed to house the Canadian government in the event of a nuclear war. Within its depths, a special room, encased in its own separate 18-inch concrete walls, had been constructed. The Bank of Canada vault was built to survive a nuclear blast, even if nothing else in the bunker did. This Bank of Canada vault, which contains about 40,000 cubic feet, you can actually see, you can walk on top of it, and there are mirrors in the corners showing, of course, that it is actually a building within another building, so you could actually walk all the way around it. And, of course, had a very ordinary bank vault door. It weighs uh, anywhere, or your guess, as good as mine, five to 10 tons. They would have locked it, of course, if you had indeed brought some of the gold in Canada here in the early days. Uh, later on, there wasn't quite so much pressure to bring all the gold here. Uh, this would have been our Fort Knox, so to speak. The rest of Level 100 houses mechanical equipment, not as glamorous as a bank vault, but just as important to survival in an underground bunker. Systems to produce electricity, air, and water were monitored around the clock. Pierre Remillard was on the bunker's maintenance crew from its first day of operation. At the beginning, I worked on the construction of the bunker. And uh, in 1962, when the building was in operation, I started work on maintenance. Pierre quickly found out that even maintenance staff did not have access to the entire bunker. Everything was top secret. Uh, when I worked, everybody had a pass, a different color, like mine was yellow, and I was working on the uh, 400 level. I was not allowed to be on the 300 or 200 or right here in the machine room at the time. So if you were another floor, you had to uh, tell them why you had to be there. Otherwise, you had a big problem. Since nuclear attack could come at any time, the maintenance crew had to keep the bunker in perfect working order every day. We were trained to keep that building in operation in case of a nuclear war. While every week we had to check every room in the building, make sure the light were working. We had to list the stuff that we had to check, make sure that uh, they had a problem through the night. Uh, you leave us a message and we had to uh, fix it through the day. If something broke at that time, we stay here till it was fixed. And in a four-story building with more than 300 rooms, most housing some type of mechanical equipment, it was an exhausting daily routine, and it was not negotiable. This battery room has enough uh, batteries in it to keep the emergency lights going for quite some time. Now, they would come on immediately. One would have to assume that, of course, power Exterior power is off now, and maybe off for a very long time. So these batteries in here turn on the emergency lights. There's another very large battery room, and it's going to give you enough power for the essential equipment, the computers and the encryption machines and that sort of thing. Uh, after a number of minutes, there are four big Merleys diesel engines that would have to be started, and that will give you about another 800,000 watts of power, and that will essentially run the building. You have enough fuel stored outside and some inside uh, for at least a month. You have approximately 50 to 60,000 gallons of diesel fuel stored within the structure, within the compound. An air filtration system was essential to survival in the bunker, since a nuclear blast would have contaminated the outside air. 
They actually did have a filtration system in place. So when uh, the rad sniffer picked up any detection of heat, pressure, or radiation from a nuclear blast, this device would actually send a signal to basically the computer that ran the building saying, seal the building down, shut off the air intakes, shut off the exhaust, make sure the doors are closed. It would have remained in that closed, shut down fashion for probably a couple of days, depending on the rate of oxygen usage and carbon dioxide production. When the levels got to the point where it was no longer safe, they would actually gulp in outside air. Now, there was a high probability that that air would be contaminated, be it with biological, chemical, or nuclear agents. And so they had a massive filtration system in place that would have removed all of those contaminants from the air, making it safe to breathe again. And then the fans would have distributed that air throughout the building for the personnel. As well as an air supply system, engineers had also thought about a water supply. The bunker is built over an aquifer, an underground source of well water, which provided a constant source of fresh water. There are two deep wells here at the site. They go down about 198 feet, and they can deliver uh, water virtually forever. We're actually sitting on an aquifer, so water's not a problem. There's also uh, three tanks inside, about 36,000 gallons of water. The construction of the bunker required the coordination of hundreds of engineers and more than a thousand construction workers toiling non-stop for months on end. Time was of the essence and delays were not permitted. To tackle the logistics, the engineers used a novel construction technique. One of the reasons it was made a National Historic Site of Canada was because we used the, the critical path method of construction here, which means that everything was going to happen right on time. They were going to design one floor while they're building the one underneath, and they're doing it as quickly as possible. The facility was constructed just under two years, and the figures that we have for how much it cost is around $20 million, and that's at the time when the average family income was about $5,000 per year. So the sums are considerable, and that $20 million is just the construction. It's not the computers that were inside or any of the mechanical systems. So it was a, a fairly expensive project. The bunker was finished in record time. Considering the number of personnel involved and the amount of construction materials required to complete the project, it was an incredible feat of engineering and political influence. But like any big secret, it only takes one person interested enough to find a leak to break the dam wide open. Intrepid reporter George Brimmel of the Toronto Telegram released the story to Canada and the rest of the world in the early 60s. It was in 1961, in fact, and I was the junior man in the parliamentary bureau. Peter Dempson was the bureau chief, and he was on vacation when I got a call from the North American desk. The telly wanted to find out what was going on out at CARP, which is about 23 miles from Ottawa. There had been bits of stuff in the papers about construction work going on, but nobody seemed to be entirely sure what was really happening. The government put it out that they were working on an army signals establishment, but the, our, our editors didn't really believe that. They felt that this was something more, more important, more significant. So I was instructed to get out to CARP and find out what was really going on. I hooked up with Ted Grant, a photographer who worked for the telly from time to time, and out we went to CARP. We weren't surprised to be turned away, and we went into town then and began chatting with the townspeople. Among those we spoke to was a tool and die maker named Louis Hupe, who knew all sorts of folks who were working in the job. And he told us they have got everything imaginable in there. They've got storage lockers, they've got communications equipment, wireless. They've got 78 bathrooms. Can you imagine it? Well, Ted Grant hired a plane and flew over the construction site and got some remarkable aerial photographs. They could keep us out of the place, but they couldn't keep us from being over it. I went into the, into the city and got back into the gallery and got on the phone and just started digging up as much material as I could about this project. And uh, a few days later, the telly came out with this story, full page, across the top. 78 bathrooms, and the Army still won't admit that, 
and then in large type, this is the Diefenbunker. Well, that really put it on the map. It was a big scoop. Everybody else jumped on it, of course, all the other papers, the radio stations, television, which was pretty much in its infancy in those days. Uh, the Telegram, having been a big Tory newspaper from its beginnings back in the 1800s, gave the thing that much more authenticity. And it was, well, it was one heck of a big story. So this mysterious site turned out to be, as we now know, the building of a secret underground bunker for the government to use in the event of a nuclear attack. I have been given credit for, for naming the place. I don't believe I dreamed it up. Convenient, Diefenbaker was the prime minister. This was a bunker, Diefenbunker. But I believe I was the first to publish the name and so I'm identified with it. The repercussions uh, were almost immediate. My bureau chief was Peter Dempson, veteran of the gallery, been there years and years. He was thick with, with uh, Diefenbaker. Dief was, he was outraged that the telegram would, would print this stuff. Peter in his memoirs wrote that Dief was standing there, he was livid, he had underlined passage of this piece in red pencil. He said that you can be sure this is on its way to Moscow even now, right now. He said this is the very kind of information the Russians want. He also said, this is going to cost me 100,000 votes in Toronto in the next election, which was a rather amazing claim. You would think that Diefenbaker would, would feel he should get credit for this very astute move to create a safe place for government to carry on in the event of a nuclear attack. No, he felt that this branded him as a coward. Well, the upshot of this was that he phoned John Bassett, who was the publisher of the telegram, demands that Bramell be fired. Bassett, instead of firing me, sent the editor-in-chief of the paper, Burton T. Richardson, down to talk to Diefenbaker and persuade him that that would be wrong. And it would have been, too. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't even my idea. I was simply, I was assigned to do a story carried out my assignment very well, and the story had a lot of impact. Why should I be fired? Dee finally saw a reason, and that was that. With construction complete, it seemed the bunker engineers had thought of everything. There would be enough food, water, air, and electricity for 500 people to survive underground for 30 days. The big question was, would the structure survive the blast? They knew there'd be a huge pressure wave. You've got approximately 25,000 square feet of space, of course, and you've got, call it 10 tons per square foot. So you've got a quarter of a million tons of weight on this building, and it's, it has to survive. This is our war cabinet. This is our Canada. We, we have to survive somehow uh, when that pressure wave comes over. We have huge steel doors coming into the place, there was a long tunnel before you get to the door, so yes, we felt very safe here. So this building was made for that. It was going to survive a nuclear attack. As the government prepared to go underground, they began to ready the population for nuclear war. Posters, brochures, and handbooks extolled the virtues of being prepared for a nuclear attack. Homeowners were advised on how to build simple yet effective bomb shelters in their own homes. We do have some statistics. We know there were about 1,700 air raid sirens across Canada, and they, of course, would have been concentrated in uh, urban areas. And I think, if, for instance, in Ottawa, I think there were probably about 10 of them. So they would have been loud enough to notify the populace. And at the height of the Cold War through the 60s, and I think even into the 70s, people did know what to do when the air raid sirens sounded go to your home fallout shelter if you've got it, or the community fallout shelter if there is one, or hightail it into whatever safe corner you can find because something's gonna happen. Stock your shelter for survival. You need food, water, medicine, eating and cooking utensils, flashlight and batteries, or candles, clothing, 
bedding, sanitary items, first aid supplies, and all the other essentials which will keep you alive in the shelter for 14 days. We've got uh, some sets of 11 Steps to Survival, which were publications put out in the 60s and the 70s by the government that basically outlined how you were to protect your family. So what to do if you saw the blast, where to go, what to, uh, supplies to have in your home fallout shelter. And we do also have actual plans for going down to your basement, gathering up the cinder blocks and putting together your own home fallout shelter. Closed for operation by the Department of National Defense in 1994, the bunker has been declared a National Historic Site. This top secret bunker is now toured by young and old, all fascinated by this Cold War tribute to Canadian history. As philosopher George Santayana said, those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. I think it's very vital to preserve a site such as the Diefen Bunker to ensure that the future knows what happened during the Cold War. The Cold War was a global conflict, and Canada did have a small role to play in that conflict, so it's important that that uh, memory be preserved. This site has been designated Canada's most important surviving Cold War site by the Historic Sites and Monuments Board, so it's the only site that's left of that period of time in any shape or form. And given what the current political state is with North Korea testing their atomic weapons, the Cold War really has not left us, it simply shifted its sphere of influence, so it's still a very relevant topic. It's a fascinating place, really. Anybody who has the time and the opportunity and is anywhere near CARP would benefit from a look at this thing. It gives one a sense of how simple things were that long ago. Our fears were grounded in pretty basic things. Nowadays, with communications around the globe so instantaneous, it's hard to imagine, but this was somewhat primitive in its way, and yet it's most impressive. The whole building is built on springs, these enormous springs that envisaged an enormous, enormous explosion which would, could shake the entire structure, and yet it would, would survive on its springs. It's fascinating. There are about three uh, radar lines across the north of Canada. Should there ever be a, uh, an attack um, detected, of course, then things would go into motion. That is, people would come here, the right people would come here, you're, you're hunkered down, the doors are locked. We'll never really know if the Diefen bunker would have stood up to a nuclear blast. The Cold War eventually cooled enough to fade into the background. We do know that with today's sophisticated weapons, an underground bunker would no longer be a viable safety option. But back in 1961, with our country fighting tooth and nail to survive a war the likes of which we'd never seen, the bunker was our greatest hope. This is a national take cover warning. An enemy attack is expected. Listen for further instructions. <laughs>